Well, good morning again. For those who don't know, don't know, I'm Pastor Josh. Blessed to be the family pastor here for a year and a half now, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but it's been awesome. This morning, I'm going to keep it easy for us. I'm going to talk about some of the favorite stuff we can relate to. Okay? And we have to admit and be real that we are really good at making excuses. Right? So everybody can relate to a Bible story that a man is making excuses. There's a lot in there. Right? You can think of the stories. A lot of excuses. Right? You got Moses making excuses. Even Noah was making excuses. Jonah was making excuses. A lot of people make excuses, and mostly because of the confidence they had in themselves, but also because it's easier. So we're going to have fun real quick, and I literally just had this thought, but we're going to go for it. All right, so the people around you, I want you to share, just the people, I'm going to take like a minute to do it, share the best excuse you've ever heard. It could be your excuse or not, you don't have to admit it, that's fine. Uh, best excuse you've ever heard in your life, ever. Because I want to point out excuses and how powerful they can be. So, take a minute, talk some about yourself. Best excuse. <laughs> Don't make an excuse about not telling an excuse. Because then you're going to be even more in illustration. All right, guys. Now, for families, that might have been kind of awkward. For families that directly, I work with students, so be nice. But for families who directly turn to the teenagers, that's not very nice. But there could be some real to it. But we all do it. Like, this isn't something that just relates to students. We all make excuses, right? And I was really, really good at making excuses. Honestly, my call to ministry took forever and God working through my life and my testimony because of the excuses I'd make, right? They weren't good. They weren't stronger than God's will in my life. They weren't stronger than God's plan in my life, but I still made really, really good excuses. Some fun ones, though. Yeah, this is one of the greatest ones I've ever heard because, like, how do you... We just talk and talk about what really happened, right? So I had a friend in high school. He really, really liked a girl. Really liked a girl. Okay, I'm not talking about myself, but I am talking about someone named Josh. My parents are here, so they can't say a thing. All right. So, if you want to hear more about my life and story, my parents are here. So, not now, but later on if you want to. But he really liked this girl. The, all right? But he's like, this girl, she's like, he's, you know, uh, above my league, like out of my league. I, I don't know if I can do anything about it, but I'm just going to go for it. I'm like, go for it, man. I got your back. I'm trying to be a supportive wingman. So he goes and he was like, can I ask you out? And he even kind of researched, snuck with friends. Like, what does she like? What does she like to eat? I'm going to take her out. Just courage, right? For a 16-year-old boy, that is courage, right? So he goes for it. And she goes, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm dyeing my hair purple this weekend. Now, keep in mind, he saw this girl all the time. And from then on out, we never saw her hair be purple. So, a really, really bad excuse. But also, he's like, you know what? Probably not a thing if that's going to be what she tells me instead of going on a date with me. I think that's fair. Right? But our excuses, when we're outside the excuses, they seem crazy. Right? After you make an excuse, you live your life, and God works in your life, you realize those excuses were simply just that excuses. But they also become sinful because they turn into lying. Like the girl didn't dye her purple. All right? That's a bold-faced lie. But it's also sinful, but it's because it's stopping the work God has prepared for us to do. Guys, we are the church. We are the, we are the church, right? And God works through us to do his work. That's his plan. His plan is to use us, me, 
all of us. That's his plan. His plan seems crazy sometimes. I get it, but that's his plan. So this morning, we are going to continue in the minors, but I'm just going to let you guys know we are skipping ahead uh, and we're jumping to Judges. So can somebody go to Judges 6? That's where we'll be hanging out. They'll be on the screen, but it'd be really good to follow along. Now guys, I'm trying to cover two chapters, right, in under two hours. Um, I don't have anything until two o'clock today, so I'm trying to do that in two hours. So I'm going to encourage you guys to, we have a Bible app, go for it, find the book of Judges, right? Be in the Bible. Actually, go home and study this because I'm talking about some really cool stories, but I'm just highlighting them. And the more you study Judges 6, 7, and 8, the more you realize how insane his following God was. The difference he really did. We're just highlighting it. So, Judges 6, all right? And we're going to talk about Gideon's feats. Now, Gideon's feats. F E A T. Yes. Okay. Don't worry. There's no feet illustration. This is that. So I have a list of them. These are all things that he is known to do. Some of his feats. Right. And when we look at this list, I want you guys to kind of have a guess in your mind what his greatest feat was. What was it? Now don't say yet. Now I was walking in. Somebody asked me, what's your big idea? I want to hear it. I couldn't tell you. That would spoil everything. All right, so we got a lot up there. Okay, his obedience, awesome. He had 70 plus sons. Okay, that's kind of crazy. He had a victory over Baal, the, the god, the, the god that they worshiped that wasn't a real god, but that's what he did. He had victory over that. He had a victory over 135,000 people, at least with just 300 men, overcoming fear, willing to serve, defeating kings and princesses in the same battle. His mightiness and his acknowledgement of God and his greatness, right? And that's just some of the list, okay? Now, if you read Judges 6, 7, and 8, you also see his failure. His failure. It's there too. But let's, we're going to, this morning, we're going to focus on the positive, right? And we're going to look at these and kind of figure out. So, chapter 6 in Judges, I have it broken up in a couple ones, but we're going to go through it. I want you guys to hear uh, God's word this morning. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. Okay, just the first chapter, this first verse, right? If you go through the Old Testament, this is a recurring theme. The people of Israel, or God's people, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And you see all the miracles and you're confused like, why? Why are they still acting this way when they've literally seen things like the sea be parted? Um, they've heard about Noah's Ark. They, had, they were taken out of slavery of the Egyptians, the most powerful nation in the world, right? No one could run from that. All these things, God brought them out and they acknowledged it, right? But then it goes back to the people of Israel did, the people of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And you kind of like in your head make fun of them. That's silly. That's ridiculous. But if you really think about our lives and the goodness we've seen of God, that we've literally been given God's love letter to us for instruction, and yet we still do evil in the sight of the Lord. So try not to have too much judgment, but it's important that we understand that they were given into the hand of Midians, right, for seven years. They were overpowered, and because of the Midian, the people of Israel made themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. So it was so bad they had to hide. They had to hide. They were scared. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalites, and the people of the east would come up against them, they would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza. And they would leave no sustenance in Israel, no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and in their tents, and they would come like locusts in number, both of them, and their camels could not be counted. So they laid waste to the land, and Israel was brought very low, and Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help. 
Again, we could just, this done the first six verses, we could just break this down, right? But let's see, what do we see here, right? We see why, why is this happening? Because of their sin. That's why it's happening. Because of like their rejection of God and then seeking other gods. How bad was it? I mean, that's just a six verse description of how bad it was. But they were just oppressed. And you keep going, verse 6 through 10. And the people of Israel cried out to help, for help to the Lord. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on the account of the Midians and what they were doing, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of those who oppressed you. And drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. So again, even though it's their mistake, God's a good God and they cry out to him. Again, why is this all happening? Because of their sin. Again, we can see how bad it is. Verse 11 through 15. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under uh, the terabith at Ophrian, which belonged to Joash, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Mennonites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to, me, said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, Why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recount to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us out from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And and he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save them? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. How bad is it again? We see how bad it is again. Right? We see the cry out because there's no one else for them to turn to. We see kind of the excuse, right? And a couple layers. First, I'm weak and I'm small. I can't do it. But if you think about it, how did the angel of the Lord, right, or the prophet of God, or God himself, how did he address Gideon? Mighty. Before the conversations even starts, mighty. He's already telling him what he is through God's strength. Mighty. He's cutting through all the excuses. He's not even following up the excuses. He's simply just addressing him as mighty. When he is known... To be small and weak. When clearly his clan, his family, his tribe is known to be small and weak. He starts out by saying, mighty. But then if you look back at verse 13. And Gideon said to him, please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. Gideon recounts, he's heard stories of God's greatness, right? God's goodness, God's love. He remembers God's greatness and his steadfast love. But he remembers it kind of, I think, how we often do it too. He remembers it like it's over, not like it's eternal. Right? We see the goodness of God in other people's life. We hear the goodness of God maybe in the Bible or past. Right? You hear your family say, maybe you have a grandma who tells you about the amazing things that God has done in their life forever. And like, that's great for them. God is amazing. But you think of it as it's over. God's love for us, his might for us, his plan for us 
is eternal. We need to, as Christian, I need to, as a Christian, focus on God's greatness as eternal, not as in, that'd be cool to live back then. We do that with everything, though. Like, if you think about it, like, the 90s. Not greatest time ever, the 90s, right? Before smartphones, before cell phones, all that stuff, right? All right? And the younger people are like, oh my gosh, what are you talking about? And the people on my age is, yeah, 90s. That was amazing, right? We think of the past like it's better than now. That's not God's love, right? The character of God is a steadfast love for us that it continues, never ceases, and is always the same. It's what makes God's story for us so amazing because we can personally turn to him and say, I've done evil in your eyes and I need you. And like the story we hear thousands of years from now and thousands of years back is God's arms are wide open and saying, come to me, my child. I love you. And in that embrace is our strength. In that embrace and our strength. This didn't go away. God never is going to go away. It always been and it will always be. What's amazing about our God does that mean his love for us has always been and will always be. So stop thinking that the greatest days ever with God were yesterday and beyond. They are now and the future. And the Bible points that over and over and over again. There's nothing going to be greater than the coming of a Christ. Right? And God's going to work in our lives with the Holy Spirit till the day happens. Whether it happens before I'm done talking or it happens in 80 years. Who knows? Right? No one. But our job is to remember that God's steadfast love and strength is there for us. And is not going away. A little more excuses, all right? Verse 16, and the Lord said to him, but I will be with you and you shall strike down the Midians as one man. Okay, so here's kind of the strength, right? Gideon shares his peace, right? God listens because God is gracious, but then he goes back to his mightiness he's gonna have to him. You're gonna strike down all these people who have oppressed you that everyone's hid from, that is out of control, just fight with my strength. Why? Because I've called you mighty. I love a good nickname. But getting the nickname mighty from God, I, I can't think of a better one, to be honest with you. Like, just think about that. I mean, I guess you had rock for Peter from Jesus. That's up there too. But to be called mighty after you call yourself weak from God and immediately say, go in that strength and change the world around you, like getting freedom, from being oppressed and hidden and scared? Verse 23 through 25. But the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is peace. To this day it still stands. The remembrance of God and his steadfast love is what brought peace, strength, hope, love. And so Gideon builds an altar of peace before peace came. So his faith is now in who God is. His faith is not in man anymore. He built an altar of peace, again, like I said, before peace happened. Because he trusts God is going to be a man of his word. He trusts that God is going to work him. Whatever that's going to look like, he trusts that's going to happen. And he wants to acknowledge it right now. Because he's now realizing God's love, like we talked about, is not just a passing story. God is alive and well and going to thrive through them. And they're going to conquer. Because of God's strength. They're going to have peace again when his family, his friends, everything around him, it's all about being hidden, being scared. Now he's going to be mighty. His peace is going to happen. So 
So chapter 7, we're going to jump ahead a little bit. Like I said, go back, read, hear all the stories. It's amazing battles. Chapter 7, verse 15 through 18. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream, as it is interpreted, he worshiped and he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of the many into your hand. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into their hands of all them and empty jars with torches inside the jars and said to him, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. This is God's victory. This is God's victory. And again, this might be what you had placed your hope in that this was Gideon's greatest feat. And you're close, right? So to break down the story, they have a spy going to the camp and during the night, the spy in the camp is saying, Gideon's gonna come with his army, we have no chance. He hears that, now he's like, okay, God's given us victory. Again, before the victory happens, he's celebrating the victory. 300 men versus 135,000. It's pretty much the matchup we're looking at. 300 men. 300 men for the last seven years were a part of a nation that was broken, that was hiding, that was in fear, that was scared, that was not strength. Their food, their crops, everything was getting destroyed. Those 300 men is what take you on 135,000 warriors. Again, so if that was your guess about Gideon's greatest feat, you're close. We see, when Gideon realizes God will give them victory, he stops and worships, acknowledges how great God is and who God is, and acts or follows. Guys, thousands of years later, God is calling us as Christians to do the same thing. Now, pause. He's not asking us to go to war with less people and defeat nations. He's not asking that. Luckily, we don't have to get that way. We have the freedom to worship God. What he's asking us to do is pause, worship, acknowledge God's greatness and who he is, and follow him. And all of our victories, before they come and after they come, he wants us to pause, worship, acknowledge him, and follow him. Thousands of years before us and thousands of years later and right now, that's the same thing God is calling us to do. So if you want to relate to this story, that's where it's relating. It's not relating by starting to play the trumpet, even though it's great. People play the trumpet, it's amazing. I don't. Right? He's not saying it started by lighting a fire and putting it in a jar and picking fights. He's asking us to stop, worship him, acknowledge who he is, and follow him. Because that's how God has designed his people to glorify him and to share the good news about him. So verse 22 and 23 in chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 22 and 23. All these battles, all these wars, right? Kings have been conquered. Princes have been conquered. Battles have been won, right? Lives have been saved. They have their land back. They have freedom. They're not oppressed anymore. Naturally, the human response is, Gideon is amazing, right? That's the natural response is, you led us through this. This is awesome. Your leadership was amazing. We can't believe it was you. Smallest and weakest, it was you. They acknowledge it. We won because of Gideon. That's the natural response. Because God does do great things for us. And honestly, it's, it's nice to feel complimented. I'm sure Gideon's like, yeah, I did this. You didn't do this, I did this, right? It was my leadership. 
But look what he says. Verse 22 and 23. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also. I don't know which son because they're 70, but for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Right there, he could say, yep, I'm now king. I'm going to be the strongest warrior. Have you written a book about me yet? Start writing. Like, it could have been that way. And honestly, I feel like a lot of our egos would have done the same thing. Yes, my family will now reign. That's it. And again, like I said, I got 70 sons, so we're going to have this handled for a while. And then grandsons, we're going to keep going. I will now be King Gideon. And these stories of how great I am and how mighty I am is now going to be focused on me. But here's his response. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Gideon could, again, easily take in all the credit. I am king. Gideon's greatest feat, also the big idea this morning, right, is acknowledge God's and his greatness in your life. Acknowledge God and his greatness in your life. Don't acknowledge the great things you've done because we wouldn't be able to do anything without God. Pause. Right? And acknowledge God and his greatness in your life. It's a great way to stay humble. And it's a great example of staying humble. It's also a great way to continue to serve God. If you know the only reason you're able to accomplish something for God is because of God, then you'll be ready to reset, worship him, and do it again. And the greatness in your life we're talking about is the greatness like his stories of the past and the future, right? It's about who God is. The greatness in your life is eternal if it comes through God. The greatness in my life is not greatness if it's something that's temporary. There are so many things we can do to help people temporary, but our message is to acknowledge God and his greatness in our life to everyone we know. We're supposed to send the eternal message of salvation through the creator of God who sent his son to die for our sins so we can have a forever relationship with God. Who even though we're just like the Israelites and we have done evil in the sight of the Lord, he's with open arms saying, my message to you is the hope in Christ. And it's for everyone. And when it talks about things that are great in your life, it talks about the greatness of the gospel in your life. That's how you glorify God with your life. Acknowledge God and the greatness in your life. So I have like four little points that kind of tie in with this. Acknowledge God and the greatness in your life. Remember God. Remember God's reign in the world. When you're living life, remember God's reign in the world. Nothing is going to happen that is going to be out of control for God. And I say it that way because years ago, I thought everything was out of control in my life. Everything. I didn't ever think I would be able to be a part of a church again, serve in any capacity because things were just out of control in my life personally, right? But I also got to think about, it's never out of control in this world. And again, I'm not going to get too far on this because they don't want to start anything. But I think we have to remember God's reign in the world, even when it comes to what's coming in November. Guys, there's things that scare us about the world. Absolutely. And we can live in the fear of that, or we can know we have the greatness of God that has this under control. Second one is, remember God's work in and through you. Remember God's work in and through you. I try to remember over and over again, and it's just again, 
I get slightly emotional about it because, again, I never thought I'd be able to be at the spot in my life right now. I went through a year that all I focused on was being grateful, right? Trying to stay humble, let God clean house in my heart and serve others. That's all I was trying to do. And it was hard, but I knew that was one way to remember God's work in and through my life. You could be in this room, it could be 107 or it could be seven. God or younger or older. God is in your life and wants to work through you. He's put you exactly where you are for the people around you so they can see God shine through you. She can show the hope of Christ to others. You let people know the only reason I'm here was God sent his son to die for me and I live for him. The third one is remember God's promises and steadfast love. Be honest, life is not gonna get it will have good days, what we'll bad days. Life's not going to get easier. And life will feel extremely tough and hard, especially when we forget God's promises and his love he has for us. When we forget the things God has done in the past, when we forget what God has done is going to do, and we forget how much he loves us, the little things, the big things, the whatever things in life that stress us out will get out of control and unmanageable. So remember God's promises and strength, steadfast love. No, I gave away. Remember God's strength. Remember God is a God who gives us strength, help, love, simply by crying out to him. Our God is so good that we can simply say, help, I'm broken. And he comes to us. He answers our prayers. We don't like the answers all the time. We don't understand the answers all the time. But he answers our prayers. Just talked this morning about God's timing. We like our timing better. We like our timing better. Until we go through it. And then we realize... God's timing would have been the best. So remember God's strength that he has for you and he has for the people around you. Do we want to be a strong church that is reaching every generation for Christ? It's going to come through God's strength. It's not going to come from the best pastor, the best worship group, the best kids group. It's going to come from the strength of God working through our church. That's how we're going to reach every generation in Christ. Every generation. My last verse. Just joking. Got two more verses. Judges 8, 28. Here's his last message, I guess, I guess about Gideon. So Gideon was... Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more. And the land had rest for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Remember the backstory of this whole thing starting us, how bad and how out of control it was getting. Right? The reign of Midian's was not good. There was not peace. It was hurt. There was hiding. There was brokenness. There was oppression. Fear, pain, hopelessness. But again, they paused and they cried out to God in anguish. They cried out to God in anguish. They didn't cry out to God saying, we deserve better. They cried out to God and said, help. And the unexpected happened, right? Gideon, small, weak, became mighty, victorious because of God. Totally unexpected. Really my last verse. 
I don't know if this is on a slide or not, but I, I'll read it. If you guys just want to read all of Psalms 107 today, it's the same theme through and through. What's well, great. But I picked these three verses, thought they went well, they were encouraging to me. Psalms 107, verse 13 through 15. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them from their distress. They cried, he answered. He brought them out of the darkness and the shadow of death. They cried, he answered. He brought them out of it and burst their bonds apart. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his works to the children of man. As we close out, they're going to come back up. We're going to sing again. If you guys want to talk about anything, have any questions, or want just prayer, we'll have an elder up here to pray with you. On the way back, if you have any questions, let me know. Acknowledge the greatness of God. Worship him, acknowledge him, and follow him. Let's be a church, let's be a people that that's what we focus on doing. Worship, acknowledge, follow. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this morning, God. God, I thank you for the opportunity to serve you, to speak your word. God, I pray that you could continue to work through our lives, God. I pray that our excuses we might have about serving you, or if you really love us, God, that would be wiped out. God, I pray that if somebody needs to acknowledge, God, who you are for the first time ever, they would take the opportunity to do that right now. God, I pray if somebody needs to worship you for the first time ever, that they would do that right now. God, I pray for the Christians that might be Christians like me, that need to stay focused on following you more and more. Stop making excuses and follow you. We love you, Lord. Amen.